Salendra Draconi, A Novel Perspective of the Psychology of Warfare. Episode 1, The Anacron Campaign. Chapter 5, Slightly Longer Than 200 Years. In the previous chapter, Slendra and her traveling companions interrupted an elegant dinner in order to present an important message to King Tobias of Eastern Pasha at Case Verge, Anacron City. The entire room were awaiting His Majesty's royal response. The king began to laugh heartily, <laughs> and clapped his hands in delight. Good show! Brava, my dear, brava! He then looked around to his other servants and asked, So who will entertain us next? Musicians! Acrobats, bring forth the royal jester! I'm not here for your entertainment. Markadar stated as he approached Linda's left side so as to keep her in the more honored right position. We have an important message to say unto you. There was then a loud crashing sound and all eyes turned in Budodar's direction. He had reached for another plate of treats and dropped it onto the ground. Really now, sir, Markadar scolded him. Look at yourself. You are making a mess. Gildardar gave the general a confused look, then picked up a plate containing what remained of a white cake with cream cheese icing. This plate he dumped onto the table and used his shiny surface as a mirror to check his reflection. He was dismayed to discover that his lips, beard, and mustache were coated in a thick film of cream, sugar, and glaze. He tossed the plate aside like a toy consisting of a thin, flat disc which shall not be identified by a brand name because the corporation did not pay for advertising. Then he bent down and borrowed a large puppy silken hat from the head of a nearby nobleman who was hiding beneath the table. This item he used to wipe the mess off his hands and face and toss it back down to the nobleman. No hat at dinner table, he admonished sternly, then took his place behind Markodar and Slyndra. At this point, Markodar had to restrain himself, for most assuredly the epic base palming this situation required would inevitably decapitate him. Instead, he merely closed his eyes in resignation and then addressed the king. I beg your majesty to forgive our traveling companion. He is not used to... He paused briefly to find a polite way to describe his surroundings. Formal engagements. The king held up his hands in reassurance. Quite all right, I am certain. Now, what was it about a message you had for me? We regret to inform your majesty, Solyndra stated seriously, that Kays for Rage is about to be attacked. Attacked? The king asked incredulously. I will never believe such nonsense. Who would ever dream of attacking a peaceful kingdom such as ours? Slyndra sighed regretfully and answered, Obsidian Shatan. The king laughed at them scornfully, <laughs> which in turn caused a fused nobleman peeking up from under the table to chuckle quietly and nervously. Obsidian Shatan? That old bastard has been bound, and by far greater magic than you will ever see, young lady. Young lady? Slyndra asked. Oh, such incredible irony, Markadar responded. Then he audibly admonished the king. Your majesty, legends say Obsidian Shatan is due to be released, and recent dictates that this castle will be one of its first targets. Where are your soldiers? Where are your defenses? Cannon? Muskets? Harpoon guns? How are you to defend yourself? I can defend my kingdom well enough, Elfman! The king bellowed angrily. And besides, I do believe that you are mistaken. Obsidian Shatan is to be held in bondage for 300 years. It has been but 200. Markadar felt incensed, even Solyndra felt slighted, and Brudodar felt stuffed from the supper he had stolen. Said Markadar, it has been 300 years, your majesty. Surely he has already been released. At this point, King Tobias stared at Markadar and wondered how a general could be so entirely insolent. Markadar stared back at the king and wondered if all humans in this castle were this stupid. Solyndra stared at Markadar and the king, wondering how long it would be until the two came to blows and Brudodar stared at the crack in the masonry behind the throne and wondered if he can pull the entire building down with his bare hands. Finally, the king rose to his feet and began pacing back and forth in front of the throne, his hands clasped behind him, and his forehead furrowed with troubled thoughts. I am quite certain, General, that it has only been 200 years. Then he sharply commanded, Call the Royal Magician! Call the Royal Magician! Answered a second voice from a hallway adjacent to the Great Hall. Soon came the sound of footsteps scurrying across the marble floor. A slender older gentleman, dressed in a flowing dark silk robe and matching silk turban rug tightly around his bearded head, ran into the great hall, stopped in front of the throne, and pathetically prostrated himself before the king. He stood back up, produced a normal deck of playing cards from beneath the folds of his robe, and then fanned the cards in one hand in a semicircular pattern. 
he urged the king to pick one of the cards. His Majesty, assuming he's so obliged, would pick a card, examine it closely, then place it back into the deck. The Royal Magician would then collapse the cards back into a regular deck, shuffle the cards a few times, then pass what he called a magic wand over the cards. The cards would magically turn into a flock of small, white, dove-like birds, which would then fly away. There would be only one card left in the Royal Magician. Alas, that is not what happened this time. The instant the Royal Magician presented his fan, consisting of a normal deck of playing cards, the king brushed him aside. No, not you! Away with you! Now, what was that other M-word? Ma, ma. Mathematician, that's it! Call the Royal Mathematician! Call the Royal Mathematician! Answered the voice in the hallway as his job only seemed to be to repeat whatever the king commanded. Presently, a second man, wearing an identical blue robe but no turban, and wearing a pair of spectacles, ran into the great hall. He was carrying a small gold-colored felt pillow, and upon this pillow was the royal calculator, and attached to the back of the royal calculator was the mystical scroll of numerology, and upon the scroll, magical numbers mysteriously appeared whenever the royal mathematician applied his long nibble fingers to the keys on the royal calculator. He also prostrated himself before the throne, but did so in such haste that he slipped on the floor and almost dropped the royal calculator. This was quite worrisome, for if he had dropped the royal calculator, then most assuredly his royal majesty would drop the royal mathematician's head from off the royal mathematician's shoulders and have it land next to the royal mathematician's feet. He had a strong impression in his mind that this would happen, and after all, that was exactly how the last guy died. Watch your step, the king warned. The royal mathematician had the faintest hope that the king would show the slightest hint of decency and compassion for him, but such a thought was dashed upon the rocks when the king added, You almost dropped the calculator. The king paced back and forth a few times, presumably to carefully consider the matter before him. He then asked of the royal mathematician, Jeremy, the elf man has stated that the obsidian Shatan has been in prison for over 300 years. Of course, we all know that it has been only 200 years. Which of us is correct? The royal mathematician, apparently an elderly gentleman known as Jeremy, had to answer the king carefully. Of course, the king had to be correct. To provide any answer otherwise would lead to his execution. His bony fingers pressed a few keys on the calculator, which in turn caused a long series of numbers to appear on the mystical scroll of numerology. It has been but 200 years, your majesty, he finally revealed nervously. Ha! The king laughed. Come to think. Then the royal mathematician continued. 299 years, 11 months, 20 and 9 days, 23 and one half hours, give or take about 30 minutes or so, but I could be slightly off. The king stood there in shock, his eyes bulging as he tried to come to terms with what the royal mathematician had just told him. Eventually, he was able to stammer out a few words. Flip, flip, plenty of time. At that very instant, as if a special effects technician stood by awaiting the direct cue, a huge purple dragon burst through the crack in the wall that had drawn Brutodar's undivided attention. He knocked down the throne and toppled the already sun king to the marble floor. Brutodar, still operating under the pretended mindset to protect the princess, instantly sprang into action, violently shoved both Markadar and Solyndra to the floor and out of danger, then stood next to them with his clenched fist shoved in the general direction of the Presidian interloper. He was not entirely certain what would happen next, but he was definitely ready for it. Behind him, nearly all the nobles jumped up from under the tables and took to their heels, as not a one of them wanted to be that close to anything even resembling real danger. In fact, the only person in their immediate vicinity who did not move was the royal mathematician. Though a sizable chunk of masonry had flown past the throne and hit him soundly in the chest, knocking him backwards, he still held the royal calculator upright in its pillow, not willing to let it hit the floor. The dragon then heaved itself onto the king's broken body, bent its neck downwards, and bit into his soft flesh. The king, torrents of dark red blood flushing from the bite wounds on his side, with mounds of yellowish fat and pinkish intestines apparent between the dragon's teeth and claws, let out a loud piercing scream. Ah! Drawing his final shallow and painful breaths, he was ultimately able to say his final words before succumbing to his dreadful wounds. Save me! Markadar stood up and then helped Slender to her feet. That sounds like a cry to help for me, right? Solyndra looked at the purple dragon, the battered and lifeless body of the king, and then at Markadar. What shall we do, sir? 
Markadar examined the scene before him, then began to bark his orders. Stay in human form. Protect any humans that come under attack. Brutus, pick up that old man and carry him to safety. Brutodar, giving only a non slapping grunt in acknowledgement, rushed forward and grabbed the mathematician around the waist, and, carrying him almost sideways, brought him to the side hallway whence he came. The old man, still concerned about dropping the calculator, cradled the item in his steady arms and never allowed it to fall. Meanwhile, Markadar and Solyndra prepared to stand their ground, although they knew how difficult it would be to fight against a purple dragon, the most powerful of all classes of dragons, and still remain in the human form with only the three of them present. The question they silently considered was whether a fire dragon, sky dragon, and earth dragon could possibly defeat a shadow dragon and successfully defend the human castle. Exasperating this conundrum was the resistance of the dragon to fight, and possibly to die, to defend a human kingdom that apparently lacked the wherewithal to defend themselves. But even still, there were at least two immediate mitigating factors. First, that the king had apparently asked for help, indeed those were his final words. And second, the villagers of the marketplace seemed to be much more honorable than the royalty and nobility of this place. Therefore, in the minds of the friendly dragons at least, those people were worth defending. After the nasty but eminently powerful purple dragon had made quite the meal of the recently deceased monarch, he then turned his attention to Markadar and Solyndra. The reason, of course, ought to be clear, as only the most intelligent readers in the world have the opportunity to read my material. Since everyone else said, run away in fright, were pulled away to safety, were a recently eaten monarch, were I taken the chance to effect an escape from slavery whilst everyone else was distracted, the only ones still standing near the throne were our three friends. Oh, there was a middle-aged chap, no less than the Bishop of Case for Age, who had quite literally crapped himself royally. He was still stuck under the table, wallowing in the filth and stench of his own self-inflicted effluent defecation, with nary an idea as to how to clean himself. This man was largely ignored, neither was he harmed in any way other than his own pride, nor did he engage the Purple Beast in battle. This will become critically important at a later time, specifically in Episode 2, when he will begin his rather nefarious speaking tour and fundraising efforts by telling tall tales of his own self-imagined heroism against the dreaded Obsidian Shaitan. Oddly enough, this purple dragon was not actually the Shaitan, but a lieutenant who was clearing the castle to prepare for his master's arrival. Apparently, Bishop Sanye never learned that little detail. So the purple dragon faced our heroes, sniffed them briefly, then turned to run past them, but he did not get very far, as he immediately found himself stopped in his tracks. He proceeded to scratch at the marble floor and pull the tables and chairs towards him, but he could not free himself from the trap. When he looked behind his back, he was shocked to find Brutodar was holding the long spikes at the end of his tail, and he was rather disinclined to let him go, thank you very much. Brutodar then recited the following badly mangled nursery rhyme. Fee, fi, fo, fum. Catch the dragon by the tail. If he hollers, I don't care. Twinkle, twinkle, little star! The purple dragon turned to attack Brutodar, slashing at his face with his long poison tip claws. Brutodar deftly dodged these strikes and answered with one of his own. He planted a fist on the side of the dragon's snout that sent him reeling and staggering backwards. Following this punch was a firebolt and lightning strike from Markadar and Slyndra respectively, but this appeared to do no damage to him at all. And did our friend the enemy dragon appreciate this in any way? No, oddly enough, it appeared that he did not. He was quite annoyed at this, for some reason completely unknown to Dragonkind. It was about the time that the Shadow Dragon turned to face our intrepid heroes and reared his head back, poised to strike, that they knew that they were in trouble. Duck! Markadar commanded, and instantly he and the princess dove for cover under one of the tables. Brutodar, on the other hand, started looking around the room presumably to try to find one of those waterborne fowl as they tasted delicious when roasted and glazed over with orange sauce, which is item number 12 on Shane's Chinese takeout menu. When the general more urgently ordered him to take cover, Brutodar finally noticed that the dragon was preparing to strike. Instead of diving under the table, as any other earth dragon with any monochrome of sense would have done in his place, Brutodar hoisted one end of the closest heavy wooden table, stood it up on end, and used it as a makeshift shield, sending gilded goblets and glass plates and food remnants, and white linen cloth crashing to the tile floor. There our friends remained while they awaited the impending attack. Now, I am very well aware that my dear readers are intelligent enough to know the legends of Dragon Breath attacks, especially the concept of fire-breathing dragons. This makes much sense, of course, 
Red dragons are the ones specifically tasked with the defense of their kingdom, and therefore the ones most likely to be involved with some of the most unfortunate incidents with humans. Therefore, human cavaliers, called upon to risk life and limb to save the fair maiden from the clutches of the wicked dragon, a fairly regular event in human folklore, which is surprising in that such a circumstance never actually happened in real life, humans tend only to know about fair dragons, and absolutely f all about the full catalog of dragon classes. So far as your author was able to determine, red dragons breathe fire, blue dragons breathe the wind and lightning, and white dragons breathe ice and water, whereas brown dragons are limited to digging holes and breaking everything they see. The green dragons of the Presidia, the mortal enemies of the red dragon army, breathe their particularly nasty putrid poison cloud. But by far the most destructive of all are the elite powerful purple dragons, such as the one our friends were fighting at the Great Hall of Case for Age. Purple dragons breathe a massively putrid mixture of hot acid and poisonous gas that almost instantly descales any dragon it might be fighting. A more soft flesh human caught within such a cloud will find any exposed skin quickly boiled and flesh sloughed straight off the bone. Even after this gruesome event happens, the poison enters the bloodstream and starts to shut down the victim's vital organs. Eventually, he will die a slow and excruciatingly painful death. In the instant case, as soon as the purple dragon's horrid breath attack met Brudodar's table, it boiled and stripped off the polished, waxy veneer of the tabletop and began to eat its way through the thick wooden planks. Certainly the acid would have completely burned through the table given enough time, but Brudodar did not want to wait that long. He hoisted the table up over his head and heaved it towards the purple dragon with all his might. The front end of this flying table struck the dragon on the side of his snout, sending broken teeth and acidic green blood spewing in various directions. The dragon then stumbled backwards upon his own hind legs, somehow regained his composure, turned around and fled out of the great hall. Stop him! Markadar commanded as he leaped up from under the table and cast another fireball. Do not let him escape! Having run out of the building after him, Solyndra caught the purple dragon in what appeared to be a powerful electric net, which circled around his body just as he started to fly away. She had a firm control of the spell's effect from the ground, and though it did indeed slow the dragon's flight considerably, it also had the opposite effect of dragging the princess along the courtyard pavement and down the stone steps, as the dragon beat its wings as hard as possible in a desperate attempt to escape. Markadar sent a few more fireballs in his direction, most of which hit on target, with others hitting the castle wall behind the dragon. This action was answered by some other fireballs, fired from another angle, as three other red dragons who, having completed their assigned patrols, arrived at just the right time to assist in the fight. However, once again, these magic attacks appeared to be completely ineffective. For some reason not immediately understood, Brudodar ignored the dragon fight and drew not only the attention of his friends, but that of the local villagers and nobility alike who tried to watch the encounter from a safe enough location that they would not be blasted by a stray fireball or falling masonry. Instead, Brudodar stared quite intently at a large stone and the outside wall of the Great Hall. Rock! He loudly commanded, Get in my hand! Before the other storybook characters could explain to the brown dragon that inanimate objects tend to remain stationary until more animate objects act upon them, the large stone in question flouted all Newtonian mechanics, busted free from the mortar that held it in place, and flew into Brudodar's awaiting hands. He then reared back in the style of old disc explorers and prepared to toss his hefty projectile. Aim for his wings! Brudodar spun around the circle a few times to gain momentum, then released the stone from his grab. When it struck its target, the unmistakable sound of breaking bones was music to the ears of the castle defenders. The purple dragon slammed into the castle wall next to him, the trauma of which forced him to change to his human form. Slender released her magic trap, and the dragon fell to the cold hard stone ground below him. She meanwhile fell to her knees next to the central fountain and tried to catch her breath. Remarkably, the dragon man was able to bring himself to his feet. His injuries from his dragon form were somewhat congruent. 
He had a large welt in the side of his face from Brutodar's initial fist strike. His nose was broken, and he had a few missing teeth from the flying table, and his entire left arm now dangled uselessly, and presumably quite painfully, as the stone that broke his wing also broke his clavicle and scapula in his human form. But even after all these injuries, he simply stood to his feet and prepared for the next round of the fight. So much for being incognito, Slender snarled sarcastically. Markadar tried to ignore her as he prepared to sling the middle of the fireball. The other three dragon warriors followed suit. Once again, they did nothing useful. The purple dragon merely absorbed the fireballs and puffed his chest out. The fire attacks were in fact making them more powerful, for reasons that the author never bothered to explain. They were interrupted in this endeavor when Private Lady, as my dear readers will recall, as a soldier who did not urinate upon his own shoes in the previous chapter, suddenly ran to face the intruder. Get ye back, you foul daemon! He cried loudly as he unsheathed his shiny silver steel sword and lifted it up to his shoulder in a ready fighting stance. Did you think we'd let you attack the castle? Now you must face me! Markadar swiftly ran over to the soldier, grabbed him by his uniform sleeve, and quite emphatically tried to persuade him to leave. Run to safety, young man, he told him. This dragon is too powerful for you. I must defend my castle, the private answered. I admire your bravery, son, but he is going to kill you. The private became even more determined. Perhaps so, but I would consider it a dishonor to back down. Markadar was briefly taken aback, but ultimately answered, Then we will help you. How that they were going to help him was still unknown. At this point, the enemy Dragon Man began to laugh derisively. <laughs> Who art thou to come up against me? He asked the private. Most surely, all of your magic, and all of your wizards, and all of your swords, and all of your armies cannot hope to defeat the likes of me. Be gone, you devil, the private ordered. Get ye back to that dastardly prison when she came. The dragon's proud and smiling, albeit broken, face almost at once became sullen as he narrowed his eyes at the human soldier. His right arm reached into the folds of his robe and in a single rapid motion removed a long, thin, sharp sword. This weapon, pulsating with shadow magic energy, he pointed at the soldier. He seemed prepared for a fight. His shattered left arm beat Todd Gam. Prepare to die, he warned the private. You first! The man shouted, then rushed towards the Shadow Dragon with reckless abandon. That concludes this segment of Slender Dragon Eye, a novel perspective of the psychology of warfare. In the next edition, a young soldier single-handedly defends his castle against a powerful purple dragon. If you wish to support me in my work, please purchase the original book from Amazon Kindle in the link in the description box. And for the more magical among you who wish to view more of my wonderful content, please feel free to hit the subscribe button.